Hi everyone, uh, this is Anna Hicks here with Mike Spivey, otherwise known as Dad on Reddit. Uh, we got some questions from you all on Reddit and we are going to do a brief Q&A with him about uh, some admissions related topics mainly. Uh, Hi everyone, I'm, I'm sitting in Colorado outside of a Starbucks. So that's actually the, the glass wall you see behind me and the mountains are in front of me. So I get to look at the mountains and you all and Anna <laughs> who, I, who I talk to every day but who I don't see. <laughs> Well, let's just jump into the questions. Um, okay, so the first one, uh, do you think medians will change in the T14 for this upcoming 2020-2021 cycle? Uh, and what about for Harvard, Yale, and Stanford specifically? So those top three. So medians always change. They don't obviously change for every school every year. So to answer the question, yes, there will be change in the T14. I would not expect, because we hear this concern every year, I would not expect Yale, Harvard, or Stanford to go above 23. There's no advantage for them to do so. They're going to get the same U.S. News and World Report credit at 174 as they get at 173. So they would rather target things like your GPA, uh, how diverse your background is, how diverse your experience is, how differentiated your application is. Outside of those three, I think you're going to see some schools go up. LSAT scores sort of at the top or up this cycle. To quote a dean of a law school, this is not my terminology, but to quote a dean of a law school, there will be winners and there will be losers. In this case, it might be the winners, again, not my terms, but might be the schools that go up. And then if you stayed flat, but a bunch of schools went up, then you probably aspire to have gone up a point or two. I do think we will see schools, I can't predict which ones, in the T14 that maybe went up one LSAT point. I don't think we'll see a school that went up two LSAT points. Okay, interesting, thank you. Um, okay, so if an applicant is already above a given school's 75th percentile for the LSAT, is there a substantial benefit in terms of likelihood of acceptance, so not looking at scholarships, uh, of getting a higher score, so going even above where you are, yeah. above the 75th percentile? Yeah. Every year I, I see people at the beginning of the cycle talking so much about 25ths and 75ths. When you're in admission, in admissions, you don't think in terms of 25ths and 75ths. You really don't. There's no, I mean, other than bar correlation below maybe your 25th, there's no data that matters. So I would encourage people who are watching this Zoom interview to not think so much in terms of 25ths and 75ths. There was one year in the 20 something years I've done this where US News and World Report used something called a calculated median. And what that meant was they took the 25th plus the 75th divided by two. So in that one year, 25ths and 75ths mattered for rankings. I would also say that in back in the day when there were faculty admissions committees, which are very rare in today's world, decision making tends to come from admissions offices. But when there were faculty admissions committees, th there was more emphasis on 75ths. Mm -hmm. And there might be a psychological emphasis on the 75th as far as scholarships. But I know you caged the question, not in terms of scholarship, but in terms of admission. If my dream school were Westeros Law School, and their median were a 169, and I had a 170, and that was the school I wanted to go to, I just can't think of a scenario where I would retake the LSAT. Okay, thank you. Hmm? Um, so will scholarships be more competitive next year in addition to acceptances? For example, will stats that would have gotten a half ride this year get less next year in your prediction? Well, the funny thing about that question is it, is it precludes the notion that the cycle will be more com competitive because it said in addition to, I'm not certain the cycle is going to be more competitive because while I think there's going to be an increase in applications, I think we're going to see an October, November, December surge in applications. I don't necessarily think the cycle is going to be more competitive because I think we're also going to see larger class sizes for, for fiscal reasons. Mm -hmm. But similarly, for financial reasons, I think that the, some of the scholarship money, if not this coming year, in the near future is going to wash up. So for 20 plus years now, we have seen an arms race in merit aid. There are some schools where 80 to 90% of the class receive some sort of merit aid. 
Right. It's really not. I also think people's applicants should not think of this in terms of scholarships, although that might be psychologically comforting. I think it hurts people in negotiation. Mm -hmm. I think people should think of these as far as tuition remission. You're still paying to go to law school. I know, Anna, you didn't when you went to UVA. <laughs> But most students are paying to go to law school, even if they have a $20,000 a year scholarship. Right. But what's happening is the tuition of $60,000 a year is being remissed downward. And when you think about it in those terms, it makes it easier to ask for more. I think this is going to be an important cycle not to be satisfied with your first amount, mm -hmm. but to ask later in the cycle, has the school received any money back? Is there any more money available for me? Because I think the offers that go up that go out early are going to be lower than in past cycles. Mm, okay. Um, okay. So how should underrepresented minority applicants identify target schools numbers wise? Um, and does that calculus change for different minority groups? So if you're African American versus Hispanic versus Native American or whatever. Yeah, that's a really good question. The, the answer is how many applicants a year are applying to law school from each. So the very definition underrepresented a minority versus the word minority defines itself as there are subgroups of the population that are not well represented in, represented in law school. Native American would be a great example. The, the number of Native American um, applicants to law school is very small. The number of black male applicants to law school is very small. You can find these numbers probably um, very precisely on the 509 reports for each school. And you can find the, the outcomes roughly on things like lawschoolnumbers.com where you can see people's results. A common mistake I see online is someone who's underrepresented minority. Let's say that Princeton Law School let me be clear because it, uh, something funny happened online once where I said Princeton Law School and Brown Law School and some faculty, faculty member got all upset. This was posted on a faculty blog and they said, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. There's no Princeton or Brown Law School. I tend to not use real law school names. Let's say Princeton Law School's median was a 165 and let's say I were uh, Native American. I see every cycle too, too many times someone who's underrepresented minority unrepresented minorities say, I have no chance at Princeton Law School because their LSAT's a 165 and my LSAT's a 160, where for my 20 years, that applicant with a 160 would be hitting it very strong for Princeton Law School with a 165. So I would look at the, the data of the school, I would look at the data of law, law school numbers, and I would not sell yourself short. But, you know, law schools look for a lot of things particularly if you're not below both medians. So if, if, I were on, if I were Native American and if I were above the LSAT, but well below the GPA, or if I were above their median GPA, but well below their median LSAT, I would still feel, feel very comfortable applying to that school. In this case, Princeton Law School. <laughs> Which isn't real, Mike, didn't you know? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, okay, so how can an applicant explain resume gaps due to full-time LSAT studying? And is it better just not to address them at all if the school doesn't ask you? Yeah, it that's a good question. These are all good questions. It depends on how long that gap was. If the gap was three months, I mean, trust me when I say this, when you're in law school admissions, you see thousands of people a year who take a few months off to study for the LSAT. So I probably wouldn't address it. If the gap were um, six months or longer, I would probably mention something in a very concise, look, what do lawyers have to be? They have to be concise and precise with their words. What, what is the most common mistake you see in law school missions? Applicants who are, who are not being concise or precise with their words. Mm -hmm. I get direct messages on Reddit all the time where I read these long uh, messages to me that, refer to words that don't really quite refer to their issue at hand. And I say to myself, man, this poor person is going to get slaughtered in the admission process because they're violating both, both of what law school admissions committees are, are looking for. Applicants who can be concise and precise. So I would, 
yes, if I had six months or a year or two years, I would address that in a, a, a agenda to all law schools. But it, it would not be more than a page long, and I would scrutinize every single word of that brief paragraph to make sure I was stating exactly what happened. I am naturally a strong student, but I am not naturally a strong test taker. Therefore, I gave myself six months and I saved up from my previous jobs so I could pay for those six months so that I could dedicate my entire time to the outside. That, that would be the kind of agenda I would write. Great. Um, okay, so here's another one on uh, timing and the sort of upcoming cycle. Um, does applying early decision give a boost for splitters, particularly at T14 law schools? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, every day I, I hear the word splitter and reverse splitter so many times. And to begin with, in admissions, so the, the term reverse splitter came from applicants, not from admissions officers. That way back when, we used to always just say splitters. And for us, that meant they were either below a LSAT or below a GPA, we didn't even define the two, reverse versus splitter. There's so much emphasis right now online about all this, is this gonna be a splitter friendly cycle? Is it gonna be a reverse splitter friendly cycle? We don't have any data yet. Right. We have zero LSAC data on how people are doing at, the, at each bandwidth. So we're, we have no way of answering that question. I can't even remember the whole question. I got so absorbed with splitter or reverse splitter. What was the rest of the question? <laughs> well, you actually answered what is the next question, which is literally word for word. Will this be a splitter friendly cycle? So you've answered that one. Um, in terms of more generally though, maybe for all cycles, um, is it impactful to apply? Is it particularly impactful for a splitter right, to apply early decision? Yeah. So let, me, let me finish with it as follows. Generally, early cycle, you see more, not all, but more law schools going for high LSAT scores early because there's, it's just a more rare commodity. There are thousands upon thousands of people out there with a 3.9 GPA, tens of thousands, 3.8 to 4.0. There are not tens of thousands of people out there with a 175 to a 180 or a 173 to a 180 or a 169 to one. Because it's 12, uh, this, this, this gets a little, I don't want to get too, too nuanced on rankings, but at face value, LSAT accounts for 12% of US News and World Report rankings, GPA accounts for 10%. So I would say there's both a commodity scarcity of resources and a psychological pull early on, whereas generally, for maybe more schools than not, schools tend to look at LSAT scores that are above their medians a little bit earlier than GPAs that are above their medians. But it's not a race to who gets admitted first. Generally, those, so, those same schools tend to recalibrate around December, January, and then people who are reverse splitters tend to do very well. As far as early decision, my analogy for early decision is this. If I were to start a casino in Las Vegas, I would not have a table that hurt the house, right? So if blackjack lost 51% of the time, I would not have a blackjack table. Early decision tends to favor law schools. If you read the language carefully, you're deleveraging your scholarship amount and you're locking yourself into that law school. Does early decision give you a bump? It does it at some schools but not all. It actually ostensibly might theoretically hurt you at other schools where they say, we can put this person on the wait list because we know they want to come here. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think without expert, I, this is going to sound like a pitch for my firm, it's not. Without sort of really good advice, I would be wary of early decision programs other than to say the following. If scholarship money is meaningless to you, if you know you want to be at that school, and if you have a need, if you're below the medians or you know, don't have something that you think they're looking for, if you check off all three of those categories, then that would be when you might want to consider applying early decision. Thanks, that's, that's very helpful.
Um, okay, so after our splitter friendly question, give me one second, I lost my face a little bit. Okay. Um, so how does an unusual major for law school, like physics, for example, right. play into admissions decisions? Physics is a great example because for a while, I don't know the current data, but for a while, the greatest percentage of majors, the, great, the, the major with the greatest percentage, the highest percentage of acceptances was physics. Now, I think there's two variables that goes into that. One is I think people who are physics majors tended to do best on the hardest LSAT section, mm -hmm. but they probably had a confounding variable of having higher LSAT scores. But when you're in admissions and you're just turning the page and turning the page application after application, and you're seeing political science, political science, English, philosophy, political science, and then you see physics, it kind of wakes you up. Here's my expression. The typical admissions person is reading your application at home on the couch. We talk about differentiation of applications in my firm all day long, every day. What we really mean is we, you want to get that file reader's attention so they're zooming in on your application. Even seeing someone with a physics major, an art history major, those kinds of things wake you up a little bit. And you pay closer attention to the application. At the end of the day, what you're doing is you're turning over the last page of the application and you're ascribing that person a score. The more woken up you are, for, for happy differential reasons, the higher you tend to tip on that score. Now there's also unhappy reasons that wake someone up, someone up, right? If you have four DUIs, I'm probably gonna pay more attention to your application, but that score is highly likely gonna tip down at the end, not, not up. That, that makes total sense. Um, okay, so, Here's another one that's a little bit uh, specific, a specific type of scenario. Um, how should an applicant explain a lower GPA from community college courses taken in high school that have lowered their cumulative LSAC GPA, or is it even worth explaining? Yeah, I'd say if you drop down below the school's median and the courses were attributable to courses you took when you were a high school student, a three sentence GPA addendum saying, whatever you do, don't compute a GPA for them. Okay? So at schools, I can't, oh, I personally couldn't stand this when people would say, I have a LSAC GPA of a 3.7, but when I recompute it and drop those three Fs I got because I wasn't feeling good, it would be a 3.89. So please read me as if I had a 3.89. Do not, to be clear, do not do that. Conversely, if you say, you know, I was 16 years old and a go-getter, and I took some classes and I was above my head, but all my college classes, my GPA was, my degree GPA was much higher. That is a completely fine GPA addendum. Again, though, two sentences, three sentences long. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Um, okay. So I have a question that I think that you have already answered, but we'll just reiterate it. Someone did ask about whether or not it is important to be above versus slightly below a school's uh, GPA 25th percentile. So I know we've already talked a little bit about that. Is it safe to say that that, you know, whether you're 0.02 above or 0.02 below a 25th percentile doesn't really have an impact or does it have? I mean, I don't, you, you know, I hate, as you know, Anna, I hate absolutes. Sure. So I hate speaking for every school, but essentially to me, if you're below the median, I mean, let's say the school's median is a 3.5, and let's say their, their 25th percentile is a 3.25, and you're a 3.23, there's no difference to me than mm -hmm. a 3.26, okay. zero. Okay. Now, if you're a 2.9, yeah, because you start correlating with underachieving maybe versus your LSAT score, you start correlating with less achievement for bar results. But no, a 3.23 versus a 3.26, really no difference. Okay, that's what but I figured one, from your previous answer. one takeaway from this Zoom thing, it might be just like, people don't need to worry so much about 25ths and 75ths. <laughs> it's a good takeaway. Sure. Um, so this is a question specifically about folks who are applying for a second time or even potentially a third time. 
Um, but what should a reapplicant be doing or thinking differently in this process? How does the math change? Yeah. So numbers that change are the most helpful. If you're a reapplicant and you didn't take your five LSAT takes in your two year period, and you think you can do better on the LSAT, don't worry about doing worse on the LSAT because doing worse on the LSAT isn't going to hurt you, right? If you have a 165 and you think you can get a 168, don't worry about a 159. Focus on that 168 and retake the LSAT for sure. If you're still, this is more rare, but if you're still in college and you can raise your grade point average, again, that's pretty rare, but that has happened, then yeah, take a bunch of classes and boost up your GPA. But other things can change too. You can apply for a job, get a cool differentiated job. I love the applicant many years ago who I got to know who works for NFL Films. So she didn't know anything about the NFL. She didn't know anything about filmography, but she got a cool job with NFL Films. And then that became her personal statement and she did really well. So, you know, can you, can you differentiate from year one to year two? 100%. Can you differentiate beyond the numbers? 100%. Every single person out there, every person, person listening to this Zoom thing, whether it's 500 or 1,000 or whatever, has at least two awesome personal statement topics in there. Mm -hmm. I've never met someone who didn't have at least two, two great personal statement topics in there. So change things up. Do a different personal statement topic. Get a different job. Those can help. Apply earlier. Get to know the admissions people. That can really help. Call the office. Talk to an admissions officer. Don't be a bulldozer about it, but you know, get to know admissions. All those things can make the difference. Even this cycle might be, you know, we don't know. This cycle could be harder, more difficult, but it could be easier. Yeah, that that's all that's all great advice. Um this is another one about reapplying. Uh, if someone is retaking the LSAT, as you mentioned, is one way to differentiate and reapplying um, as early as possible without much experience in between, without a lot of, you know, especially if they applied late last cycle, applying early this cycle, there's not that much time. Um, how should that person go about tweaking their personal statement or changing their personal statement? And you I touched on this a little. Yeah, I would do an entirely different personal statement. Okay. If, again, everyone out there has... It, it, it is my considered opinion from 48 years of living and 20 something years of admission, which is becoming a pretty significant chunk of my life. I just <laughs> noticed that there's no one out there who doesn't have a couple really fascinating things about them. If you've lived, I mean, look, I admitted, I helped admit a 12 year old once that person had a personal statement topic. So if you're 24, <laughs> you should have two personal statement topics, correct? It's the math. Uh, <laughs> right. I, I jog in these beautiful mountains most every morning. And on a lot of those runs, I think about different th parts of my life. And then it dawns on me on some of them. Wow, that would make a really cool personal statement topic. So if I have 40, the most people out there probably have 20 because most people out there are probably about half my age. <laughs> so redo the personal statement and get to know admissions better. Don't be like a buddy from Wall Street. If you know what, I, you have no idea what I'm talking about. I have about. no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so I'm talking about the 1980s version of the movie Wall Street, where Charlie Sheen's character would send the CEO of this investment firm a bottle of like his favorite whiskey every year. Mm. Don't, Don't be do that. creepy about it, right? I think sometimes there are go-getters out there, who, and I appreciate this, but who think sending a postcard to a school every day of the year for, for 360 straight days shows, um, you know, drive. It doesn't, it shows creepiness. But you can pleasantly call the admissions office and say, I know Dean so-and-so is really busy, but Brown Law School is, has always been my dream school. And if she has in her schedule, you know, five to 10 minutes, anytime in the next two weeks, particularly because I don't think people are traveling as much this year, I would mm -hmm. love to introduce myself. And I promise to be mindful of their time. That kind of sentence would go along. Look, people apply for jobs at our firm. Now you know this. If someone were to, well, hopefully they would call you, 
But, and they would say to you, you know, I know, I know, you know, Mike must be very busy, but I just wanted to introduce myself and I promised to be mindful of his schedule. Of course I would talk to that person. But don't call and ask for a job unless you have an admissions experience. <laughs> okay. Moving on. <laughs> well, we just, as you know, we get a lot of people who apply yeah. for yeah. positions that are firm. We know admissions experience. So we can't do it. Yeah. Um, okay. So do you have any thoughts or advice for STEM students in particular with relatively low GPAs uh, on writing a GPA addendum? Yeah, I saw that question. I think most law schools are very, or if not all law schools, cognizant of the fact that most STEM majors have a sort of come to law school most often with a lower GPA than non-STEM majors. If, you, if you're not demonstrably, considerably below the school's median, I wouldn't even touch it. So again, if the school's median is a 3.5 and you have a 3.2 and you were a you know, you were a math major or, a, or, you know, is organic chemistry a major? I guess it is. <laughs> yeah, I can't, it's been so long. I just remember organic chemistry being a ridiculously tough class. Right. You know, if you were pre-med, pre-med would be a good one, and you have a 3.2, that school is going to see all your pre-med courses. Right. There's no reason you need to, you know, fire off a two-page addendum about how all your courses were pre-med. Right. If you were below a 3.0, you may want to mention, you know, you were, I mean, a, a good example would be, I was a pre-med major because both my parents are doctors. And my first three years, I was living to satisfy their dreams. Mm -hmm. But, you know, along the way, I realized law school was my dream. So I just want to call attention to the fact that a lot of my classes are relevant more for a medical school track and I wasn't, I didn't have a candle lit. I wasn't inspired by that. Once I had a spark, once I took a philosophy class and I started debating, I started getting A's. That sort of GPA addendum is totally fine. Okay, okay. I kind of, when I answer some of these questions, I want to apply to law school. <laughs> You're like, I'd be I a great applicant. This, remember, right. <laughs> you would Go be ahead. a great applicant. Um, so is there anything a non-traditional applicant many years out of undergrad should be focusing on differently than a normal applicant? Yeah. But, and does the LSAT the, count more in that scenario? I would say the LSAT counts less in that scenario. Mm. By very differentiate, by very definition, you differentiate. You're non-traditional. When I start the very, in 19, wait, no, that was, don't, no. In, in 2000, when I started my academic career, in admissions, the admissions side of my academic career, we had a Vietnam vet in our law school. I wow. imagine that person could have had a substantially lower LSAT score. I didn't admit them because I, ju I just started and this person was a 2L. But I suspect they, might, they may have very well had a lower LSAT, maybe not, I don't know. But their life experience added so much to the community of the law school from a, you know, just 40, 50 years of living experience that they, you know, could have easily talked about that. I'm not just talking about having been a vet, but just 50 years of life experience. Again, at 48, there are so many things I could talk about that, you know, would differentiate me from the typical 22 year old. So I, I would say if you're non-traditional, you know, good for you, you have things in your background that others do not focus on those. Yeah, that makes sense. Um... So on to the next one, also about addenda. Um, how useful are LSAT addenda, and is there ever a downside to writing them? And do you have any advice? Actually, this is kind of a separate question, but do you have any advice for anyone planning to write an LSAT addendum due to COVID-related circumstances? Oh, well, that's interesting. So, so in general, I personally did not find LSAT addenda, or if you're applying just to my school, an LSAT addendum to be very helpful. Right? I knew what your LSAT scores were. Now, with that caveat, I will say that if, you're, if you had a family member sick, if you were ill, if you had a specific life challenge such that you scored a 158, a 158, and a 170, a concise 
one to two paragraph addendum about what happened in your life when you had those two 158s sort of, you know, colored in the picture more for me. So similarly, if COVID has impacted you, it has had, it's impacted all of us. So I think I, I'm a little bit less averse to an, to an LSAT addendum about COVID scenarios because every month that goes on, not just applicants, but law school admissions administrators, higher education administrators, are probably being impacted more by COVID. Law school budgets are, are being shrunk every year. There's more stress from the top down. So even if COVID was particularly stressful, then I would be more apt to say to go, to go ahead and go for it on an, on an addendum. The one thing I would not say is, I took the LSAT six times and please pay attention to my 170, not my four 168s. Right, that's a pointless <laughs> addendum. Right. <laughs> if there's a reason behind it, and if you can be concise about it, then I would write it. If your if your outside addendum is more than a page long, you are really doing something wrong in your addendum. It should be a paragraph or two. Okay, so it sounds like it definitely can hurt if you use it in the wrong circumstances. If you do it in the wrong way, is that yeah, accurate? Not, like, if there's not a challenge in your life that you overcame then you're probably doing it in the wrong way. If there was a challenge in your life that you overcame, but it's taking you two, two pages to get to that challenge, look, your personal statement can be a, you've seen, we have many examples on our website of personal statements. Yeah. We have one on my personal, I have a personal website, Spidey Blog, it's just a motivational website. I have an example there. The one there is just, it's just a story. It has nothing to do with law school. That person got into a, t a top five law school. It was a splitter or a reverse splitter. I can't quite remember. And they got in early in the cycle. Your personal statement could be a wonderful story of, of overcoming. I mean, I have, I have jaw issues. I have to wear a mouth guard. I could write a two page personal statement about how, the, you know, when this manifested because of stress in my life with family members undergoing cancer and, uh, you know, there were multiple people in my life with cancer at the time. That, that would have nothing to do with law school, but that would be a really good personal statement if I, if I did it the right way. But your LSAT addendum should not be dr a dramatic story. Right. So it doesn't need to be, it's, it's just the facts, which can be a paragraph or two. Right, that, that makes total sense. Um, how do an applicant's undergraduate school medians affect their chances like the medians of, oh, across the whole school, the median GPA coming yeah. out of this school for law school applicants. And does right. it hurt right. someone to be below that median? Yeah, so if you're from a service academy is a great example. I'm not sure if median is the right word, but yeah, the, 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 I think it's called LCM on your cash report or something like that. It's, it's your school's, what the midpoint of the, average GPA of, or, the, or the median GPA is at your school. Right. If you're at the Naval Academy or at West Point, that's probably like a 3.0. So right. if you see someone with a 3.1 from West Point and you're in admissions, you see the LC, I think the term is LCM. It's been a while now for me. You see the LCM of that school and you know a 3.1 is, is like that person is hitting the books in a serious student. Uh, Princeton has notoriously low in, in this case, I'm using Princeton as a real example. Princeton undergrad has notorious, it has really fought against grade inflation. Mm -hmm. And law schools know that. So they will, in their head, they will psychologically bump up your GPA relative to where it is versus the schools, some schools with notoriously high GPAs. I mean, there, I'm not going to name the school, but there's a school where I, when, when I was in admissions, we used to get applications for where every single person had a 4.0. That school was not really doing that person with the, the, the 20 people with the 4.0s any service because I was always knocking them down because right. I was sick of seeing 4.0s from that school. Right, right. That makes sense. Um, and in the case, the flip side of your West Point example where you're below the, the LCM, is that harmful in and of itself? Yeah. If... Yeah, if you're underachieving relative to the midpoint, 
then schools will take notice of that. Okay. Now, if you're if you're underachieving because you have a 180 LSAT and your GPA is below the median, but you had an illness in your family for two of your four years there, there's a perfect, perfect GPA addendum. Right. And it makes a lot more sense when you color in the picture. Sure, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think, you know, in getting back to COVID, I think schools are gonna be more understanding of, of situations now. I was supposed to, I was supposed to be on a flight to the New York World Trade Center Marriott on 9-11. Not just me, but a lot of my friends and admissions. So that morning, 9-11 happened, and I was supposed to be on a flight to the World Trade Center Marriott where the New York City LSAC forum happened. Point being this, we were, because we were so intimately close to that situation, we were very understanding of flexibility and different needs during that entire cycle. Admissions officers are understandably very close to the COVID situation. And I think they'll be understanding too. Sure, sure. Um, do you have any particular tips for international students applying during the next cycle? Yeah, I mean, you know, in general, when you're an international student, to begin with, you differentiate because culturally, probably you have something in there. I mean, one of my favorite personal statements, it took me forever to talk this applicant in the, in the writing about this, was about her going to a Halloween party in a costume. Because she had no experience with Halloween from the country she was at. So it was like this like dramatic, like, you know, and she, but then when she was in the costume, she could be herself. Right? Mm -hmm. It's almost like, you know, wearing a mask in today's world. You can, you know, be a different person almost. And she found an extroverted side of her when she was in that costume on Halloween. That was a beautiful personal statement. So mm -hmm. my advice is, is as follows. You can probably write a personal statement that is going to be differentiated. And you probably have, during the global pandemic, maybe challenges that the typical American applicant doesn't have. I mean, I don't, I'm not an international um, visa or international law expert or close to it, but it's really hard to get a visa right now. Maybe your parents were trying to get back to your country and you wanted to see your parents or something. There are probably scenarios that over the last year that would, differ, that would differentiate you relative to the typical applicant. <coughs> you okay, Anna? <laughs> Just something stuck in my throat, I promise. Allergies, okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so those, those tips were helpful. This I, I mean, this is why I always have water with you. Right? <laughs> also, uh, I would add, always have a five-hour energy with you in case these go longer than this <laughs> In case this interview goes five hours. <laughs> It'll last the entire interview. <laughs> okay, so how will law schools, especially in the T14, view employment gaps slash applying while unemployed? Uh, and will schools be more forgiving because of this, because of COVID? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm not going to differentiate between T14 and non-T14. Okay. I think just about every law school is going to be more forgiving. It's, I mean, there's, what, 20 million people unemployed right now? You might know the number. I don't. I don't know. Not the top there, of my head. You know, if, if, you, if you don't have a job this past year, that's potentially more typical than, than atypical. Yeah. So I think it's going to be, schools will be very forgiving about that. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, Here's a, another one totally unrelated to COVID. Um, how much would an honors th thesis benefit or distinguish an applicant, especially among top three schools? Yeah, I know. I know, like, for example, uh, we have, I think we have four people on our team from Harvard. Yep. And in, their, in the Harvard application, there, there is a question about that, about, you know, published writing or, or a thesis. So obviously for the Harvard application, if you, done a thesis, that's helpful that you're not leading. Like anything that you can't answer that's left blank is generally not great in law admissions. So if a school asks, have you, you know, ever published anything or, or had a thesis and you get to fill in that blank versus saying not applicable, it's a little bit help helpful, but I still think it's more of a feather on the scale versus like a heavy foot on the scale. 
Sure. You probably didn't see me smash my foot down, but I did. <laughs> we can see the general motion of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, Here, here's an interesting one. Um, what is the difference between a personal statement and a diversity statement in terms of what they convey? How should the two be differentiated? Yeah, I like. I, I, I saw that question and I like it. So there was a, there were a few years ago that a top five law school changed their personal statement prompt to ask for a little bit in there about yeah. about what brought you to law school. It was, it was one of two hundred schools, and the reason why they did that, I believe it filtered to us why they did that is they were getting far too many like these like masters and in, in creative writing type things where someone wouldn't would send a two-page poem <laughs> and think that that was like you know the the best way in the world to differentiate with that caveat aside incidentally every time i look, I look in this direction it's because there are people talking loudly up there <laughs> hopefully it's not distracting right we're okay okay and hopefully they didn't hear me and they're not going to walk over and slug me for, for saying that. <laughs> um, unless you're just what wildly off topic, right? If, if, you're, if you're waxing poetically for two pages about nothingness, then you're, you're violating a, you know, a, a clause of how you should write your personal statement. But in general, I think people do well when they write the personal statement for themselves and not for an admissions committee. If I'm writing about how I woke up for a month and I would have to pry my jaw open because for a month, two important people in my life had cancer and I didn't understand it, but I was clenching my teeth at night, that's a great personal statement topic. Or I could turn it into one because I know how to write a personal statement. On the diversity statement, it is much more important to me that you first define what your diversity is and then write about how it enables you. Look, diversity is good, but it's because it enables you to see the world from different perspectives, including your diverse perspective. That is, that's a little bit more factually based than writing a personal statement about learning to ride a bike as an adult and crashing in the mailboxes, which is a little bit more creative liberty based. So to summarize, because I don't think I'm, I can just see the look on your face, Anna, I don't think I'm quite driving the point home, I would say with, if your diversity statement is about diversity or if it's about overcoming an adversity, you want to first define what that is. I grew up in you know, rural Texas practicing the Muslim religion, and no one else in my town knew what that was. Mm. That's a great diversity statement. But you want to start off like that. You don't want to start off sort of you know, in, in a creative writing fashion. Right. With a personal statement, you have a much more liberty to be a little bit more differentiated. Is that helpful? Yeah, absolutely. That that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, so how much does the prestige of an applicant's undergraduate institution matter? You know, it matters a little bit. Back in the day, again, when there were faculty admissions committees, I think it mattered more. Mm -hmm. But when I, when I was in admissions, keep in mind when you're in admissions, except for during global pandemics, you travel to schools. And I had a few schools, I'm, gonna name, I'm actually gonna name one. I adored going to Davidson College in North Carolina. The reason why I adored going there, not, not only was it beautiful and quaint, but the students were well-dressed and professional and mindful of my time. Every year, mm -hmm. so they had training on how to approach an admissions table. Hmm. So when I saw an applicant from Davidson, they would always get a little bit of a bump in my head. I can't tell you what schools every admissions officer in the country thinks of, like I thought of a Davidson, sure. but we all have had them. And if you tend to have gone to a really strong, very selective school, you know, based on the numbers, I know for a fact Princeton is an incredibly selective undergrad school to go to. So you probably get a little bit of a bump from having gone to a very selective undergrad school. By, you know, the fact that they're selective means the competition at that school might be a little bit harder amongst your classmates. That helps you too. 
But I don't want to overly fine point this because it's not a huge moving of the needle. I didn't admit someone just because they went to Davidson. If they went to Davidson and they had three DUIs, I didn't waive those three DUIs because I thought they were a well-dressed, respectable person. But it, I, it, I, swear, I swear it factored into my decision making. Sure. West Point factored into my decision making. I appreciated people's service. I had been to West Point's campus multiple times, and I knew that their median GPA was lower than most schools. That makes sense. I, I just can't tell. I just can't like list off every school sure. because I think it, to some point they're idiosyncratic per the admissions person reading your file. Yeah, that that makes sense. HBCUs, I, I think to some people really matter, rightfully so. You, you, there's there's a lot of schools that are that will will matter to some people, but might not matter to every person. Okay, that that makes sense. Um, should finishing undergrad early be highlighted in an application? It's probably going to be noticed by the admissions office anyway, right? If it, I mean, when you're in admissions, yeah. you read trans, you read fifty to hundred transcripts a day during file reason season. So you very quickly see when someone was there for three years versus four. Right. I don't think it necessary necessary like um, it, I don't think it's necessary to write an addendum just that you you finished college in three years versus four. Sure. If you're 15 years old and you did it in three years, yeah, you might want to write a diversity statement because you're a diverse applicant relative to the pool. You're 15 and you went to college for three years. Right. <laughs> I hope all the 15 year olds watching this video take note. <laughs> I mean, Anna, there really will be one or two 15 year olds who apply to law school get this cycle. Yeah, fair enough. Um, okay, so this is, oh, here. Okay, this is kind of the inverse of a question that I asked earlier. Um, how can an applicant address a higher cumulative GPA versus a lower degree GPA, like in the case that they went to community college and those grades significantly brought down their overall yeah, GPA. If it's a cumulative GPA, I wouldn't address it at all because the school is going to care okay. about your cum and not your, your degree grant, your, I'm sorry, not your degree GPA. So just, just don't call around. attention to it. I mean, the last thing you want to do is say, I have a cumulative of a 3.7, but my degree GPA, GPA is only 3.3 right. because I suck with my degree. Just leave <laughs> it alone. Yeah, that, okay, but does it like hurt chances of admission even if you just like leave it? No, okay, okay, great. I mean, I hate absolutes. So I, sure, say, but in general. I, can't, I can't say I 100%, <laughs> but I just don't see a scenario where that okay. would hurt you. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but hey, only sit boards speak in absolutes. Do you know what I'm quoting? I don't know who you're quoting. I know in general what you're quoting. Some, uh, yeah, I don't know who I'm quoting. It's from Star Wars. I, I could have I told you that. You okay. may or may not want to splice that out of the Zoom. It's up to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's just go to the next question. Let's keep going. Um, okay, so for applicants who don't uh, take a break between undergrad and law school or KJDs, uh, what can or should they do to make their applications more competitive? Yeah, I mean, you definitely don't want to say, hey, I'm a KJD. Because again, you're just illuminating something they already know. Right. It's probably not necessarily a strength. Right. It's kind of the opposite of that non-traditional question. Mm, yeah. So, I mean, although maybe not necessarily, you might not have as much life experience as someone who's 35 and, play, and applying to law school. But if you're 19 years old and you're applying to law school, or if you're 22 years old and applying to law school, and you did something really cool one summer, job-wise, that's gonna stand out even more. If you worked for NFL Films when you were 20 years old, and that film was on the, the NFL channel, and you were an integral part of that, it's almost more cool that you did that when you were 20 than if you were 35. If you were a go-getter at 17 years old, and you know walked into a law firm all my friends at law firms are going to hate that I'm saying this. Talk to the front <laughs> office person and then talk to the managing partner and convince them to give you an internship. That's going to be cool. It's going to stand out. Mm -hmm. Although I only encourage people to do that if they have sort of a high emotional intelligence. <laughs> right? 
because you, again, you don't want to bulldoze into yeah. the farm and demand yeah. a job. Absolutely. You want to, yeah, you want to slalom them around until people want to give you a chance. How did you start your job at Spivey Consulting, Anna? Spivey Consulting was looking for someone who could do graphic design and was applying to law school, and that was a pretty limited population. Right, and you were a graphic designer. Yeah, yeah, I was a graphic designer. You were a go-getter intern, and you just moved up the ladder. Yep. That probably, when you applied to law school, that probably looked pretty cool. Very true. Um, okay, so this is a question I think I know the answer to. But uh, is it too late to take the LSAT in the fall? And how much does rolling admissions matter? Yeah, so I'm not sure. The question is so interesting. If, I think you tell me on it, but I think they mean is that if, they took, if someone took the LSAT in November, is it too late for the... To like apply and still have a good chance at admissions, I think. I think, I mean, the answer is... Not only is, no, is the fall not too late, but the spring isn't too late. And in some cycles, the summer isn't too late. Mm. I always tell the story of the guy who called me. He was in Japan. He was an American citizen, but he was in Japan. And he called me, and he just got his uh, June LSAT score back, late June. And he, and he got like a 178, and he said, can you help me get into Harvard next cycle? And I said, I think I can help you get into Harvard this cycle, because I knew applications were down yeah. then. Yeah. Sure enough, even though Harvard's, I mean, again, this is, don't, I'm not talking about this cycle. So don't call Dean Jobs in Harvard, at Harvard and say, well, Mike Spivey said, because this is like six years ago. But six years ago, sure enough, it said on their website, you know, we will not accept applications after whatever date, March 15th. I had to beg this guy to apply and he got in. So not only is the fall not too late, but again, the spring's generally not too late and the summer's not too late. Schools will, if, if a school has a need, they will almost always make room for a strong applicant. Okay, so for your average applicant, uh, is there a certain point in the cycle where it starts to be the case that timing is a factor against you versus a factor yeah, in your favor? I, I would ideally, if, if I were applying to law school, I would ideally apply before Thanksgiving, and then I would, but I wouldn't give myself an arbitrary deadline. Yeah. Because I, I would also say I would rather have my best application in rather than a forced application. So if my best application meant I needed to take the December LSAT because I knew I could score two points higher, I would shoot for, you know, ideally December and then applying over the holiday break and having everything in by January. Do, okay. people, do people tend to have a little bit of an advantage if they apply September, October? Early November, yeah, in a vacuum, yes. But let me let me just say something for the record. If I could score one point higher on the LSAT in December versus September, I would wait till September. I mean December. Yeah, no, just that, one, that makes just sense. one LSAT point would make would flip that in in, the, in my head. For me. Okay, so the better application is always more important than the timing yeah, in your mind. Yeah, it's a long interview, but I hope people make it. To this point, because that's a, I think that's important. an important thing to, to point out. So that was actually the last question that we had from Reddit. Um, yeah. I had a couple like non-admissions questions, but we can or cannot do that based on you know what it's, you prefer. What's in on one fun question? And I think this was about an hour and a little bit, so that that'll be perfect. Okay, great. Um, okay, skipping my career services one. <laughs> Uh, so this is one that I know you actually have written about before, but a really long time ago, I think, on our blog. So I'm curious okay. if there's an update. Um, you, I know, and a lot of people know, have visited a huge number of college campuses. What's your favorite college campus that you've ever visited? Yeah, so I did, I did blog about that, didn't I? We should put, we should repost mm -hmm. that on the blog, although then, the, then 200 colleges would be mad at me. <laughs> Um, I love BYU. Mm. I have a really fond memory. I was in Utah about two years ago, and I was actually speaking at the University of Utah Law School. And then on, my, on the trip, I drove there because I'm in Colorado. I drove there with my dog. On the trip back, I stayed at Provo, and my dog and I hiked this mountain right 
in the backdrop of BYU. And I have a beautiful picture of my dog's little pointy mountain ears overlooking a mountain point in the ears. So what we'll do on it is we'll, is we'll, we will redo that vlog. I'll make sure BYU's on there. And we'll use the picture of my dog looking over the mountains as the backdrop to that vlog. How does that sound? <laughs> that sounds great. Can I end on one more note? Of course. This is important to me. Every, almost every day I see someone say something online and sometimes they, 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 are, they might seem like an expert for whatever reason. That's, that's like almost a binarily bad piece of advice. Mm -hmm. So my plea to applicants is, is the, tr sorry, this background is, is the triangulate advice from multiple sources and never take one person, what one person says with, with abject confidence as the all-knowing advice. As you know, Anna, even at our firm, almost every day we bounce emails off of each other because one person may have one perspective, but 15 other might have a different perspective. Absolutely. So never base like an application piece of based advice based on one thing one person says online. That's all I got. That is great advice to end on. And thank you, Mike, for doing this long interview that hopefully is helpful to, to some this folks. Good, this is good for you, Anna. I took, off, I took off half your day. I have to go jump on multiple phone calls. I think you probably do too. I do too. <laughs> okay, All right. I'm going to leave you alone. Thanks, Bye. Mike. Bye.